Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Episode 89, Cunning as Folk in Astromagia with J.D. Kelly. J.D. is a modern-day cunning man. He's an astrologer, herbalist, tarot reader, and conference organizer. And in this episode, we get into how to balance all of these skills, exploring the idea of being a master of all trades while mastering some. We also talk about the Astromagia conference that he is organizing in October. It's October 8th through 10th, and we'll be featuring some amazing speakers such as Austin Kopic, Freedom Cole, Demetra George, Christopher Warnock, Cliff Lowe, and many others, as well as myself. I'm going to be doing a talk on 17th century astrologer herbalists. Uh, I'm going to talk about people like Nicholas Culpepper, Joseph Blagrave, William Lilly, and extract lessons and very practical techniques from their corpuses. It's a really interesting tradition, and I'm excited to do this talk, to hear everybody else's talks, and to just be part of this amazing event because uh, these are some of the most heavy-duty astrological magicians that are currently practicing and reviving this illustrious tradition. So check it out at astromagia.org and sign up. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, here's the episode. Okay, so today on the Plant Cunning Podcast, we have modern-day cunning man, uh, astrologer, herbalist, um, and astromagia conference organizer uh jd kelly and we're really excited to talk to to jd today uh jd's based in scotland and uh the, yeah where there's a lot of a lot of fun stuff on the uh, agenda mm-hmm. so uh jd how are you today i'm doing well i'm doing well we've had for us like uh it reaching a temperature of over uh 65 degrees fahrenheit is quite rare for where we are so we've kind of enjoyed the summer unfortunately i feel bad saying that obviously given how hot it was in lots of other places but yeah i mean isn't most nice of, weather most of europe's europe's in an extreme drought right yes i mean i think that uh especially further south of us it has been really bad uh for lots of people but um, but yeah, no, I'm doing well. I'm doing really well uh, in general. I was very ill at a certain point over the summer, and I remembered what, I hadn't been so ill in a long time. So it was kind of like a wake up call to remember <laughs> how sick you can be and how nice it is to not be unwell, you know? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so recently recovered. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that you're feeling better, that you're healthy. Thank you. Um, yeah, sometimes you need that the the opposite uh to to, so you don't take it for granted Mm -hmm. definitely yeah (laughs) how are you guys doing really well lots of projects at the homestead and weather's uh finally cooling down a bit and um we have some really cute kittens here these little orange (laughs) cats that are just like so cuddly and sweet that just eat up all of our time (laughs) Definitely, <laughs> as they should. As they yeah, should. you have to enjoy. I love it. kittens and cats. Oh, it's glorious! I'm glad you had have that in your life. <laughs> yeah, we're super stoked. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, they're born right right in the bedroom, so they're mm. they're very socialized. <laughs> yeah, mo- the mom must feel really safe with both of you. If yeah. uh, that was the way it was, that's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. She came and got me. I was on like a business meeting and she was like, row, row, and like it's smacking time. at my keyboard and it's like, it's time. Like, come on, let's do this. So, oh, so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> That's so sweet. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so JD, um, usually we ask something like, what brought you to the plant path? But what, what, what brought you to the cunning path? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, uh, I think that for most people have been odd uh, in their interest for a while, you know, there's probably something that starts in the beginning where they were drawn to, um, you know, unusual things. And like a lot of kids, uh, 
that I definitely fell into that category. I was a teacher of young children and pr uh, primary age, elementary age kids for about 12 years. So in that work, I started to notice this is not a, something that all children, at least in my experience, do show, but it is more common than not common. Um, and I feel really lucky to have a nephew that is very odd, you know, and I uh, was I appreciated his odd uh, interest from the beginning. So I think that it was something that I couldn't ignore. Um, and to be brief about it, you know, what I would say is that I did have a lot of unusual. I, and again, I don't know how unusual they actually are. But like I did live in quite a haunted house as a child, so I knew something was quite odd about that, you know. Um, I was very interested in uh, magic from a young age and religion from a really young age. Um, but I, because I grew up in Alabama um, and, and also because when my father's mother uh, was very an, a very avid reader and library goer. And, you know, this is like card catalog time. I would go in the card catalog and look for books on magic. And the only books I could ever find were stage magic related. Mm -hmm. um, so I did explore that as well, you know, I, but I was always looking for where are the... Um, where are, I imagined the real book somewhere. And in my mind, there was like a book that I would pull in the adult section of the library that would open like a chamber that would lead down to all of the, the real weird books that were somehow beneath this library in Southern Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day a large scale bookstore opened up in my town. It was the first one that showed up. Um, and there was a new age occult section within the library. And I was startled. I remember being about 11 years old and thinking, wait, there are new books on this? Like it didn't make sense to me. <laughs> and so I probably put for anybody that grew up in the, you know, the late eighties, early nineties, will know uh, Llewellyn publishing quite, quite obviously was very strong in that, uh, that time. And I guarantee you, I put a few of their children through college, you know, because <laughs> of the number of books. I also luckily had have worked jobs uh, uh, at some capacity since I was 13. So I always had my own money to spend on stuff. And I just bought shed loads of books. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was the kid in the neighborhood that read tarot cards and talked about astrology. And so all the kids would come to me and you know, uh, I would be that person. So uh, oh. eventually I realized that that was, that could be one's vocation. And I took that more seriously about seven years ago and then five years ago started, you know, doing it uh, more full time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. But just odd, odd from, you know, early on mm -hmm. or weird from early yeah. on and, um, Yes. <laughs> and so what do you do now? Like, what is the last, what does the last yeah. five years look like for you? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So um, the, you know, like a lot of people, uh, there's always that strong, I don't know, there's a lot, most everyone suffers from a degree of imposter syndrome, you know, where you're kind of like, wait, is this something that I actually do? Um, so I think that, you know, there was a long term, I've uh, been paid for or given exchanges for the work that I've done from longer than that. But I think that there was something that changed. And I decided to focus on because people aren't that comfortable with everybody wear, with one person wearing all the hats, you know, all the time, like they kind of need at least an, an image that can be what you are. And because astrology was one of my oldest uh, interests and obsessions, I thought, and I developed a lot of competency in doing that work, then I focused mainly on astrology and card reading because, so I think that in the end, I work as a diviner counseling astrologer, kind of uh, as most of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, in the last two years, as Isaac mentioned, like uh, did finally get around to, to putting some energy into uh, 
uh, conference that was focused on astral magic, which is a term I prefer over astrological magic because that astrological magic has a very particular uh, thing that it means and within the Western tradition, whereas mm -hmm. astral magic is a little broader term and mm -hmm. I think is is easier to encompass like a broad range of practices, uh, beliefs or discipline studies uh, that kind of can be brought under a general umbrella of earth sky relationship and how we interact with that, you know? Um, so yes, yeah, so I mean, that's really what I get up to, get up to now mm -hmm. more than anything else. Cool. Yeah, that, that also, um... I've been reading uh, Religion and Decline of Magic, uh, and it's a really good uh, book on on like the 16th, 17th century magic and astrology uh, and so on. Yes. And they talk a lot about the cunning. I'm reading about the cunning men right now. I mean, yeah. I've read previously, but this is uh, going into it again. And, and they, they do seem to ha do a lot of different things, you know, but and they, and each cunning man or wise woman would do different things, too, from, you know, someone would read geomancy someone would use mm. a, a knife and a uh, scissors and a sieve <laughs> you yeah. know as div divination um but the divination was sort was one of the big aspects of it but there there are a lot of different skills that they have and on your website you uh you say that you're a jack of all trades mastering some and <laughs> that's mm -hmm. like for me that's really important because like i feel the same way i've i've got sagittarius rising mercury and gemini moon mm -hmm. aquarius Uranus, you know, in my first house, yeah, I'm yeah. very, you know, eccentric. I like to do a lot of different things, but I also like to get deep because, because if you, you know, you got to get, hit the water. If you dig, if you're digging for, yes. digging for water, digging a well, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a definitely yes. a test of balance. So yeah. What do you, what do you, what do you think about that? What, what's, what's, what's your, uh, right. so I think, you know, the, this is okay. So I have to, I think that there's a couple of things that are there around it is that, Obvious, I think, and astrology is a really interesting place to look at this. I think also magic is a larger subject or herbalism also is a larger subject is, is uh, also a good place to look at it. You know, um, the, uh, the idea that one is going, and again, I'll stick with astrology, the history of astrology is very long. And then there's also uh, outside of textual bits that we have, you know, we can also talk about skyscape archaeology, which is learning to look at landscape interactions and, and lore around uh, sky earth dynamics that is now telling us things that, you know, is difficult to uh, keep that stuff necessarily recovering that is a very complex thing for cultures that are no longer ha around or didn't have written records so i yeah. mean that is so vast and the idea that one is going to um know all of that <laughs> you know is kind of an absurd thing you know mm -hmm. um so uh you know the Another one, and going back to the education side, I originally I thought that I would work on uh, my original background is in anthropology, so I I, I wanted to uh, carry on and go on to you know pursue an academic career as an anthropologist. Um, there's not, there's all different reasons why that didn't come to pass, but. Um, I went from about to work with. Uh, university age people to working with preschool age children. Okay, so I was a preschool teacher for four years. And in that time, I was working with one to three year olds. So in my mind, I thought, okay, well, you wanted to be a master pedagogue or something, you know, you <laughs> wanted to be like the one that understands it from beginning to end. And so you have to start at, not at the ass end of it and going back down, but you have to start in the beginning and work your way up. Mm. Um, and, you know, I did eventually work with university age teachers and kind of work, you know, my way up a bit. But I'm just trying, what I'm trying to get at is that the idea that one would ever be fluent and then competent in all aspects of a single field is a daunting task for 
most people, you know? Um, so, and, and there is some emphasis in the world to say that if you want to learn something, you need to kind of focus on it exclusively. Yeah. Um, and I will return to that in a moment because I do think there is some truth in that. Uh, but I, but I think that, um, in having been obsessed with similar, uh, like things over my life. I have found that uh, it's very cyclical and, you know, almost spiraling kind of type way of learning where you do return to things. Um, and I think you guys uh, work very much and are present with the, the place that you live. And so season after season of being there and knowing its life, do you know what I mean? And how your life interacts with it, that competency and knowledge uh, and how it's changing you, changing the others that you inhabit is always uh, going somewhere, you know? Um, so I think that, if, you know, and this is the last, the other thing that I wanted to mention about it is that if someone does though want to really get a strong um, sense of something, foundational learning is so important. Yeah. And the reason I would say that is because foundational learning, you can, especially I always say this with people interested in astrology as an example, is that, you know, pick, have fun and like go around and learn all the different stuff for a while, but then find one author or one YouTube channel or whatever that you like a lot and spend a good amount of time just understanding and studying their material. Because once you have foundational knowledge in something, you can really go somewhere with it, you know? But if you are willy-nilly about how you, how you learn, then, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, that has its own place as well. Um, yeah, I think when you have the foundation, so yes, there is something to be said about letting go of learning everything about that thing all at once and focusing on the foundation. So for some people that might be modern psychological astrology, for other people that might be traditional astrology, spend a couple of years with one author and one text or a group of texts. This is how I, you know, my main background whenever I started to really go deeply into herbalism was through Ayurveda. And so I spent time with, uh, with the materials of, uh, of an Ayurvedic doctor called uh, Vinod Verma. And I, stud I read all everything she'd ever written mm -hmm. and spent many years just with her stuff because then I had a foundation that I could go from. Yeah, you know I mean, but otherwise, so I think that's important, but yeah, I definitely uh, agree with you. And I think that at the beginning, when you're first getting into something, it's good to really take a wide uh, perspective and look at a lot of different sure. things. You can see what, what appeals to you the most. And then you go deeply into one thing for a while. And then after mm -hmm. you've like thoroughly gotten, gotten everything out of it that you can get, then going to another, you know, group. It'll come back. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll, and that's, that's the other the thing. thing. Yeah. Like, like I started learning about wild plants and like foraging when I was like nine and then through like college, I kind of focused on other stuff, but then it, when it came back, I had that uh, foundational knowledge there and I could, uh, art could, could, could go further. Same with like music. I've had like cycles of where I was more intense into it and you don't like you, you lose some, but you, the, the muscles are still there. The, the mm -hmm. tracks and space are still there. Definitely. As long and as I think that it ties into two things from like a more, you know, if I was saying to one lineages of practice, and I would also call them lineages of passion or lineages of obsession, obsession, you know, mm -hmm. which is we can tie into uh, lineages of those who have come before who have shared similar um desires to know and engage but also as well it's very smart at times to see uh see types of knowledge as gods or as god forms that are also mm -hmm. not not tapping you on the shoulder and letting you know it's time to like do this now do you know what i mean so yeah. um i think giving a little bit more agency mm -hmm. to the side of 
the lineages, but also the, um, you know, the, the personhoods that those things become uh, or are, you know, that, they, that we can engage with them more directly um, uh, and learn through that, you know, and it's, and it's also the other thing is that, you know, we really struggle, I think, memory and not and knowledge keeping is something that's really has changed so much in the last several thousand years, but particularly in the last maybe 40 years, you know, for us as humans, that are acknowledging that some of that knowledge is held between uh, us and those God forms or the lineages. It's not up to us to just remember everything, you know what I mean? And all the time, you know, yeah. it will come back uh, through those more, uh, more, um, those other ways of, of it returning to your life. We were talking a little bit before we hit record for, for the show today about how there is this pressure to know everything. And once you start studying something, then people sort of maybe expect you to know things or, you know, and so we were talking about how it's okay to not know something and to just admit that. Yes. I think that one of the most powerful things for us to be able to do, at least for me, especially within if we wanted to talk about like a cult esoteric uh, or whatever community, you know, was to be able to say, um, oh, I, I don't I don't think I'm familiar with that. Can mm. you tell me more? And it's still something that I'm learning, you know, because I think that the natural reflex is to say, um, yeah, is to say, uh, of course, you know, we're just doing knowing not like nod. we're all supposed to already know everything. Yeah. Um, but it, but that was one of the things I noticed uh, working with in education was that um, uh, developing a desire to be a learner requires that you put yourself in scenarios where you don't know and are not competent at something over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is an anxious place for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we can be more supportive of others by not creating more anxieties for them to think that they should already know and know how to do everything. Yeah. Um, but the other side of it is, I think, too, is that... Um, because we do live in a time where there are conditions that kind of are forcing people to identify very strongly as something. Uh, and it's kind of like mixed in with the desire to feel more empowered, you know, which I think is its own question, really what that is. I won't talk about that with you guys, but um, the issue around that to a certain extent is how do we give credence to those who have come before us who have done you know the work within the fields that we're involved in um yeah what how do we how do we do that well when there is so much uh desire to just kind of already know everything in the beginning so yeah. i don't know that's something i sit with around it and talking about that identity thing too there's this uh, I mean, in, in modern Western industrial society, people are very specialized, you know, like you go to like the university, everyone is like super specialized. And then you go look on like social media, everyone is has their identity, like <laughs> in their yes. bio. It's and it's it's very, yeah, it can be so, so difficult just to sit with ambiguity, where like, no, I'm not this and I'm not that. But from yeah. like me, and I keep I, I'm sorry, I keep coming back to me, but like that is my is my an example, you know, yeah. like I find it difficult to identify with any one thing fully because it's it's my 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 I am always changing. Yeah. You know, like yeah. all of us are always changing and we and it's I, it's, I don't think it's true to uh, to fully identify with just this label or this uh, persona that is projected on social media or and i think it's gotten worse with social media but <laughs> for you yeah, know i mean i it's think it's it's the yeah there's so many things that are well quite i think maybe not so many things but as you said social media and a few others that are really a huge part of it but i think if we just kind of focus more on what we do yeah and let what we do to kind of speak for itself mm. you know and if others others do identify 
Do you know I mean? Because it is a natural thing to say, yeah. oh, you do this or whatever. Yeah. Then um, that's okay to me, you know, to do that. Uh, I was, like you said, the reason that I ended up calling Thing, the work that I did, you know, because you have to call something something cunning as folk, you know, why did I go with like that as a, you know, a name for something. And it was because I was, I was inspired by the multifaceted and, and also the oddity of de depictions of at that time, I was mainly reading about English cunning folk. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as you said, they weren't the learned you know, and this is something that I've focused on a little bit in my studies around the uh, astral knowledge that they would hold, as opposed to those that would have been the formal learned uh, scholarly um, astrologers, you know, um, which is that they weren't the learned scholarly astrologers, do you know what I mean? Uh, they weren't philosophizing about it they weren't the the astrological doctors that were mm -hmm. prescribing uh things based on astrology they were a little bit closer to uh everyday folk in that they had as you said also a wide variety of skills and also had very unique personalities mm -hmm. um but there weren't it wasn't like there was one all there wasn't like there was one that there was there was one everywhere. Do you know what I mean? They were, there was not a huge number of them either, you know? Now, if you look at somewhere like India, where there's a massive amount, there's a guru on every corner, do you mm. know what I mean? Kind of thing. Um, you can have moments in societies where uh, we do have lots of spiritual guides, teachers, uh, and then people that are using methods that we might label magical to solve issues and problems in the world and help people um so maybe we are going into a place now where it is more like guru on every corner but you know in that in those cultures a lot of times there's a high level of knowing who's full of crap and who is not yeah you know and yeah. i think that this is a main thing is that i do think we have to understand that it's important for those of us that know a bit about these things if, if we've been around it long enough to point out when someone you know to point people in the right direction I guess yeah. is what I'm trying to say um you yeah know, but but the jack of all trades mastering some I think is we can we can have a little bit of faith in our own uh learn learning intelligence that it carries us forward in a way so if we do let go of something for a little while we don't need to feel shame about that uh it has a lot of times there's transferable skills and then things do um cycle back around you know? right yeah the transferable skills i think is a, an important point too because like i know from for instance with music like if you learn how to play guitar it's easier to learn how to play banjo like they're mm -hmm. both fretted mm -hmm. stringed instruments they're different in a lot of ways but there's a lot of transferable skill in the same way even with like magic and with building a porch like you're visualizing the porch then you're making you're manifesting it like you're, you're you, you know there, there are yeah. some skills that that are uh the same you know or, or transferable at yeah, least in some way totally and you know like uh something that happened recently is that uh because i had a lot of background in ayurveda for a while or a strong time where i spent with that um doing self-massage and like doing uh oil massage is like a con is like a daily practice i've taken on for several years now um but I still, you know, last week I went to a massage therapist, <laughs> you know, because I think it's important that we also do realize that there are people that, you know, have the ability to, you know, we shouldn't feel shy about turning to another that has a competency in something that we, that we want to engage with. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, but I think people should trust it a little bit more um, and, yeah. and, and just keep at it, you know, that's the thing, it'll come back, you know, it'll come back. Yeah, and I think another aspect of, you know, Jack of all trades, master of some is, 
just having to be adaptable. You know, we've talked about that on the show a lot before, but, you know, we, we live in such changing times and having a little bit of skills from various different healing modalities or, um, you know, different backgrounds and different earth skills and things like that can be really important. I think it is really important. I agree with that. Um, I definitely do. And I think that, but it's also okay, you know, if someone's approach is to be hyper-focused, super yeah. interested in something, it does also produce some fascinating characters and, you know, really good. So I think that we can, we can feel good about that. Um, but I do think it's a lot of shame around developing a lot of skills, uh, and that's why I changed the phrase, you know? Nice, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, th I think another important part is honoring each individual person and their proclivities and their uh, inner mm -hmm. guidance, you know, and what, what <laughs> their, their obsessions, like their passions. Yeah, and, and that's why I think if you tie that into lineages of yeah. obsession, do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Or passion or whatever we want to do or practice or practice or whatever we want to do, then I think, you have another another way in which there's some intentionality that isn't just you that is helping you know along along that yeah and that this is one of the things that i'm really excited about uh the astro magia conference mm -hmm. is how many different lineages of obsession you have yeah. brought into it you know <laughs> and it, it's really kind of amazing looking at the speaker list um you know you've got some there's some pretty big names there like i'm real excited to see austin Kopic and freedom cole mm -hmm. Demetra george uh christopher yes. warnock who is one of my teachers mm -hmm. um and then just so many other like chris uh, uh, cliff low you know there's there's gonna yeah. be a lot of great people speaking and a lot of different people like rune uh rasmussen like that's gonna be yeah. fun too i'm really excited because yeah. he's got like looking at the old norse uh and way of using the moon and the sun and the on on year i mean that's astral but it's not astrological in the way that we yeah i mean you could call it i think the thing is you could call it an astrology yeah i think that um uh because you know the and that's one of my main things is like i know it's cumbersome to say astrologies plural or yeah. or you know and uh it is cumbersome to many to say that but um, you know, this year I had an insight going back when, um, when the celestial art was published, mm -hmm. which Austin was one of the editors for that, that, uh, anthology, um, I think by three hands press. So right before that was published, I thought, you know, the time is right for there to be a conference focused on, uh, astrological magic. And I thought it had, it would need to be online. So this was yeah. back in like 2007 or 2000, well, maybe I'm mixing up the year, 2008. Um, and I thought it had to be online because it is slightly niche. And then it also is hard to do like an in-person thing in the beginning because of the overhead and all of that. So um, you know, a lot of people think it was just because of the kind of things that have happened in the last couple of years that was there, but I thought it would always start online. And then the desire was true to what I would describe as like the Magian spirit of like wandering, you know, mm -hmm. that it would go around, you know what I mean? This was like the desire that would be in places, mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, kind of thinking about that. So, for example, if you're familiar with looking at astrological charts in any capacity, okay, so you don't have to be an expert, but if you've ever looked at an astrology chart, it's a map of a very particular kind of information that is mainly mapped to the zodiac, you know. So, a lot of people don't even think about the, the fact when they see on a kind of circle chart that has an MC. Uh, that kind of looks like it tilts like uh, this, you know, the MC never tilts. Like it's just uh, always above the head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's oh, always it's like, it's always that intersection between the local meridian, which runs north, south, right over our head. And then the Zodiac, it's the Zodiac that is actually moving differently. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The Zodiac moves differently. So then mm -hmm. we, 
anyway, the reason I point this out is because uh, I think that in my early work I did in astrology, eventually around uh, 19 years old, I got very interested in observational astrology. So I was wanting to say what what is actually out there because I my grandfather was a meteorologist and had a telescope and so I spent a lot of time um, time with that. Um, some people the and this is something that ties back into something you mentioned about um, uh, the decline of the enchanted world, you know which I don't think we really ever got to this point where we don't think things are enchanted. You know, people still can be staunch uh, material rationalists and talk to a cat, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, well, or also, whatever. it's also only in the educated elite classes that it's been disenchanted. Like, there are still... Sure. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And I think and I think the thing, though, is, though, is there is something about, and I, I use a term called children of this problem. I think that astrologers specifically are a very interesting group of people in that what we're seeing occur, if we go back far enough, we're seeing the rise of exact science occurring because exact science needs to show itself and the mathematics that not that it wasn't already there there was there's a lot of evidence that suggests it didn't go in this direction in other groups and other times but there is something about it where this uh, this kind of uh, detaching from lived uh, experience um, direct experience of something so when we look at a map we don't spend a ton of time thinking about, well, what was the sky actually like at that moment of a person's birth, the sky itself, you know? We immediately go to things that relate to the disciplines around Western astrology, for example, if that's our framework. Um, and not that that's a bad thing, but what I think is interesting about uh, looking at the intersection between astrologies or astrology and magic is that magic is very much about direct participatory engagement with something, mm, you know, yeah. like the planets are these, like we could say, you know, they could be thought of as uh, in some ways like um, laws of nature, you know, that are, uh, we've discovered, you know, and you kind of can see where Platonism and Neoplatonism and all of this is so intimately tied to a lot of the ways we think about astrology. I'm not I, too much to say now, but like the point really is around it is that um, we can become uh, less present to. So I think what's great about what uh, Rune does is, you know, and, and there are others is like um, looking at the relationship between um, cycles, uh, things that we can see and observe, but also the landscapes in which we inhabit, because any yeah. sky that you participate in is your sky. It has direct involvement with the ecosystem and the life ways of the others that you share that landscape with. Do you know what I mean? And if we, if we are inspired by uh, contemporary and what we know of other cultures that have had a very strong knowledge of sky earth dynamic, this is a very natural thing for, for that, for those ways of thinking. And this is my largest thing that I'm really trying to cause to happen with Astromagia is I want it to be enough of a mixed group of people that we do start to have a context to feel inspired to recover and engage more directly with uh, the sky earth dynamic, you know, and the way it's storied. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, actually looking at the sun and looking at the moon and looking at the stars, it, it yeah. is very different than actually just like looking at a chart <laughs> it is. print out from the computer or just look on the, on this, on your phone screen or whatever. Yeah. It is very different. I remember the first time that I saw the moon through a telescope, my immediate reaction, I just started crying. You know what I mean? 
Uh, mm -hmm. And so what is it about the moon and me seeing it that brings forth water? Do you know what I mean yeah. for me? <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. All that can mean something. Do you know what I mean? And it's it wouldn't happen if I just look at the moon uh, in my nativity as it's drawn as a map. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the most basic things I always tell people, which I think you guys can which I think is so easy to share is say with the moon again is knowing what phase your moon was in when you were born and knowing to see it in the sky, you know, is it out late at night? Is it out early in the day? Is it out? When is it out? And not going to it and letting it teach you about what your moon is. Do you know what I mean? Because even if it's not the exact like the metonic cycle hasn't repeated for it to be precisely the exact moon you know i think that we can give be generous and like allow it to be something that we open up to building a relationship with it um which is why you know for me personally i think i have a very strong uh animistic uh disposition you know um be, and i think that that is important for us to try to re reimagine you know and the work that i'm trying to do with it is new animist astrologies you know what does that mean um you know letting dawn teach you about dawn letting mm -hmm. twilight teach you about twilight engaging with the sky in the dark time of year because this is something that will teach us about what the sky can tell us about darkness in the darkest time of year or whatever you know so we're a bit more you know these are easy ways to start so that's your class, actually, that you're teaching at Astromagia, right? New Animus Astrologies? Yes. yes. I mean, really that's good. the hope anyway. Yeah, I'm giving a talk for a group called ESAR yeah. on constantly unfurling, talking about uh, animus uh, conceptions and astrology. And then this one will be like a follow on, uh, follow on from, from that. Uh -huh. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, last year I struggled to give a talk because, um, and I'm going to give it again at the beginning <laughs> this time because uh, I wasn't as experienced at that time ma managing like multiple Zoom things all at once. Oh yeah. So the moment I went in to give my talk uh, last year, it shut everybody else out. Oh, oh no. no, it's okay. This year yeah. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a learning curve. There's a whole whole different set of, of uh, organizational skills for an online event than for yes. an in-person event. Both difficult. Both, and there's, yeah. yeah, there's always going to be something that comes up. So <laughs> we all get it. We're all like, <laughs> used to it. But um, could you speak a little bit more? You were talking earlier about your vision and your goal for this conference. Like, why did you create Astromagia? Yeah, so I feel like the this. OK, so the sense I got, it's not this. I have a problem maybe always seeming like I'm going to criticize something. Okay. So I'm just, this is more an observation that, um, you know, outside of astrological conferences, like if we're talking about an astrological conference, there's a lot of good spirit and goodwill at an astrological conference. There's, there are people that don't get along always, you know, and there's always something there. Sometimes yeah. it is quite personal. Sometimes it's a bit more academic not getting along whatever yeah. um uh but because of the being in person there's almost like something that does make it easier you know to mm -hmm. we kind of focus on what's good the problem that i noticed within the astrological magic community proper in terms of western uh astrological magic as it's kind of emerged in the last uh 20 20 or so years is that um, the places to really talk about it were only on uh, social media platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think that there, there's nothing, and maybe there's not anything inherently wrong with the idea of what social media might be, right? But the way in which it does play out, it mm -hmm. often is problematic. Like, oh, yeah. and, <laughs> and exactly. And the other thing is, is that you get a lot of adherence of particular teachers ways of approaching something yeah so you'll get like a a, a place where it is that there are a couple voices that are thought to be authoritative and 
And again, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? But I felt like it was time now that the discourse was growing uh, for there to be a place that could start to create more context for a larger scale, more open, bigger idea around um, what, at first I thought astrological magic, you know, and it's like more, uh, more uh, strict sense. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, once, uh, because I have, uh, because I have an anthropological thought around most things in the end, there is always that, there's a lot of cultural and a big, much bigger thing that is behind this, you know, uh, which is also why I wanted to incorporate artists and um, people that were in, I, this is why I say it's focused on astral magic and its contents because it's also looking at all of the creative uh, expression and cultural expression that is also is tied into uh, this reemergence of uh, astrology as a way of knowing the world, you know, or astral magic as a way of engaging with the world. Yeah, that's really cool that you're creating that space. Yeah, that was the desire. And this year in particular, looking at astral, the relationship between astral magic and astral lore, you know, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, within uh, properly, I think within astrology, we, uh, there's a lot of talk about doctrine, you know, the doctrine of whatever it might be. Um, and I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think that we sometimes forget that that is lore or lore is probably tied into that. Mm. Um, so the way that we, uh, you know, the way that we engage with the story that is present within sky earth dynamics was very clear to me as something that was already important, but really needed us to bring some attention to this time. So, um, you know, there are some key figures that are giving talks uh, like Demetra George or Cadmus or Sacha Ravitch, or even, as you mentioned, Rune, talking about ways in which um, story and sky, earth, are kind of being woven together, you know? And I think that uh, this is something I spend a lot of time with personally. You know, I try to walk in the place that I live for a couple hours every day, no matter what the weather is. So I know when the rabbits are doing the crazy rabbit things on the hill and when the rowan berries are blue are ripening, you know, yeah. this is an invitation to story, in my opinion, you know what I mean? What is going on in the landscape, me being able to know that um, these seasons and these times are kind of tied to it. And sometimes be more flexible with my rigid Western astrology learning because in that case, we want to kind of fit everything in. You know, Gordon White gave a really good talk last year about how, and I do think it's pretty accurate. He, he described how the, there seems to be like a tendency, a uh, Hellenistic intellectual tendency to put everything into a, like almost like cells of a spreadsheet. So, you know, there could be something about rowan berries and um, rabbits, you know, that I suddenly now need to put into a, like a slot that is related to a certain planet or a certain cycle or a certain, you know, as a way of categorizing it. Yeah. And I think that this is this is also what I'm trying to screw with a little bit with the conferences, like how we can start to allow things to just speak for themselves as we encounter them and we learn do you know what I mean as opposed to I have this template that I need to plug everything into and it needs more voices than me to do that obviously yeah <laughs> well I think also just showing the diversity of voices you know from people who are very like strictly traditional astro western astrology mm -hmm. to people like Rune um, and some of the, other, like, uh, you've got some uh, ho hoodoo stuff going on in there. Yes. Uh, there's, got hoodoo, lots there's like a Risha yeah. stuff, you know, and this is something I would like to expand on as the yeah. conference carries on as more and more uh, 
uh, different voices and perspectives that can, I think it has to be transdisciplinary. I've yeah. been really fortunate this year, I'm presenting at a conference here in the UK called Trans States in September. And Trans States, I have to tell you, was the conference I attended in 2019 that really gave me the model that I wanted to use for, um, for um, this conference, which I do think it needs, it has to endeavor in a transdisciplinary way uh, towards this. Otherwise, you know, we're not really, I don't think it can do it justice, you know. So with all the different subjects and um, folks that you've brought in, who is the right audience? Like who is going to want to attend right. this conference? And yeah, that's what I, I'm always happy that anybody wants to attend. So I would say <laughs> anybody that feels interested in it. I mean, I think that it is, again, that's a, a very good question. I probably should have started with some marketing model that looked at that from the beginning. But I just imagine that, again, it kind of follows that framework that I, that I say is like, if this idea of like playing with and learning more about earth sky dynamics and the way in which it has relevance to your life and to the life of others, to the place that you live, you know, if you feel like that is an obsession that you can kind of feel in you, then you should definitely be there. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. And if you can't make it for some reason, don't ever be shy. Reach out and just say, you know, that this is something I can make it to. Is there another time it's going to happen or whatever? We will keep doing them. Nice. You know? we will. Yeah. Maybe not every year because it's a lot of work, but. Oh, okay. Maybe not every year, <laughs> yeah. but every other at least. That's cool. I'll see. And yes. is there anything that you're particularly excited about or a particular speaker that you're just super stoked on is going to be here? Wow. I was so happy with everybody's. I mean, the other thing is that uh, because I know that um, because I know that uh, it's very difficult for people to find a way into talking at these things, you know, I also try to give a lot of space for people that haven't had a lot of opportunity yet to speak. So um, I am excited for them to have an opportunity to be able to share, you know, um, with, with people. But I was just thrilled, you know, Demetra George had given a talk not that long ago for, I think it was Astrology University uh, that is related to the talk that she's giving now, but she didn't have the opportunity in that to explore the level of the story that she wanted to mm. so i was really happy to give her a context to to be able uh to explore it from a more storied lens That's um awesome. but yeah there's i wouldn't say that there's anyone that uh mm -hmm. i am really happy to see dana trell you know this will be dana trell is the translator of the latin picatrix that came out recently um i can't remember how long ago um but I am really happy to see that Dan has kind of stepped into, because um, that's an uncomfortable place for a lot of people that are scholars. You know, now you're a scholar mm -hmm. and now you're speaking to uh, a mixed group. Uh -huh. so, but yeah. that was the whole thing is we wanted to bring together people that looked at it academically, scholastically, looked at creatively, looked at it from a practitioner level. Yeah. Um, and that was part of that transdisciplinary idea you know yeah yeah well i i'm really excited to be able to give us a, a, a talk you know this is my first um yes. talk at a, at a conference like this um so i appreciate you know uh mm -hmm. l l letting new voices you know get get it's in there important. Yeah. yeah very important yeah and I'm, I'm excited for a lot of the there's a lot of different different talks so it's gonna be a lot of fun i'm, I'm gonna so for i'll I'll do an intro beforehand to talk about this, but you know, I'm going to be talking about um, 17th century astrological uh, medicine, basically and herbalism. So that's been really interesting to me lately. And yeah, there. <laughs> it's a fascinating, a fascinating uh, time in which there's a lot. Of, and that's the thing people don't realize, like here there's universities that I live. Well, they were quite close to where I live now where astrology was taught in the university yeah. Yeah. as a way of approaching stuff, you know? Um, 
and, and I don't say that's like the glory time of whatever, but it's the same time. It is a very un, um, interesting and important moment to understand, you know, yeah. and, and see what's relevant now. Um, well, it was the, the last great flowering of traditional astrology uh, before the Enlightenment, you know, and, and yeah. all that came along with that. <laughs> definitely and it's also in english you know they they, they spoke the same language that we do now <laughs> a little different yes. it's i know and uh it's very likely that you know some cunning folk practitioners would have at least had books or something mm -hmm. that they yeah. were also looking at whether they knew how to read them or read them to do the work that's always another question but you know, that that was the other piece that last year's conference kind of brought forward was the idea and something I will talk about this year is this category of learned academic philosophical learning mm -hmm. and then the kind of lower, more folkloric learning and knowledge that is held with a straw with things that we might call astrological. Yeah. And then there's this intermediary group, which tends to be the get your hands dirty uh, kind of people where they're applying ideas that relate between the two. And the cunning folk people often inhabited that middle group where they mm -hmm. knew enough to get themselves in trouble uh, between <laughs> both groups, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it reminds me a lot of like sure. occultists in general, you know, like there's a, a lot of, a lot of, they, like they're not accepted in the, up until recently not accepted in, in academic circles yeah you know but they also have ha, like have a tremendous amount of learning and book book re, book learning especially you know as well as practice exactly. and it's kind of like yes. between those yeah i mean like for instance like john michael greer like he tra helped translate the picture christopher warnock mm -hmm. like christopher yep. warnock has a jd you know like uh, he's a he's a he's a lawyer yes. but um JMG doesn't have any high, any like, I don't think he has a master's degree or, or a PhD, but they translated the Picatrix, like they translated yeah. many texts and like, they've got a tremendous amount of, of learning, you know, <laughs> but Definitely. Not, not necessarily <laughs> accepted in the, in the elite uh, academic circles. Yeah. No, no. And a lot of times the way in which those, you know, the history around that more elite knowledgeable group how they view uh, the more folkloric side of what is known. For example, you know, many cultures have a lot of lore around the moon as it relates to mm. when you cut your hair and when you trim mm. your nails and what you do and don't do on days of a lunar day, for example. Um, a lot of people would look at that as not being, you know, it doesn't have rationality. It doesn't have uh do you see what i'm trying to get at it doesn't right. have yeah. that uh kind of higher uh level of knowledge that's inside of it um so patrick i was really influenced by a guy named patrick curry around that that he looked a lot at um you know what makes and that was where i first saw these different astrologies mm. lower astrology middle astrology higher astrology you know so a lot of Western uh, traditional astrology really emphasizes higher astrology, but then you see a document or a book like the Picatrix, and it actually contains lots of knowledge that is from all over the place, you know, yeah. that's something that Dan and Trell will talk about, you know, to this time around. So, yeah, that's very interesting, but uh, yeah, it, that, being in that middle space kind of gives you a little more leeway. Uh, going in either direction like you have the intelligence to be able to read the higher things and understand them but also you don't have the limitation of being part of that uh right. limit click you know where you're not allowed to 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 think about or t talk about or practice yeah. the the lower or to get yeah get yeah. your hands dirty right you know, yeah. doing anything like that was a bad bad idea yeah um, <laughs> but yes yeah i mean anybody that's done magical work to like i know it from a lot of the talismanic work that i've done um you yeah there's a lot there's a lot mixed in with how you are using text and what comes from those traditions but then about the lived experience of yeah. being with 
uh, the practices of entangling your life with celestial or astral spirits and then sending that stuff off to someone else to be part of their life. Do you know what I mean? And you're, you, there is a reason why I think it is much nicer to not get your hands dirty. <laughs> Just talk about talk about it from a more abstract perspective, you know. Yeah. But um, something the ivory tower and all, ivory yeah. tower and all, yeah. on the armchair. Yeah. But at the same time, this goes back to that uh, mastering some. You, you yes. to actually really master anything. You have to you have to get your hands dirty. You have to practice. Like the practice is where the rubber meets the road and where any actual like um yes. embodied learning comes from that's where like your your muscle memory comes from uh, your yeah. intuition it comes from actually doing the practices and getting your hands dirty mm -hmm. i agree and i think it also is something further going on which is there in the not maybe i think you know gordon white again he's really been good in like contemporary uh, esoteric community and occult community drawing forth this thing that the idea between uh, theory and practice can never really be separated. So mm. even the idea of theorizing obviously is a kind of entangling, practicing mm. is a kind of entangling. But I do think what you're saying is so important. It's, you know, just, and, and I think this is also something that people should feel more encouraged around is, yeah, you know, there's a lot of fear around getting something wrong with mm. stuff you do. Like you guys will know from an herbalist perspective, you know, there can be a lot of concern around, like I remember recently, and I don't know if this is a reality within uh, the herbalist community, but you know, there was like suddenly, is how much licorice is like too much licorice? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> suddenly, and have I been causing problems by, you know, all, just as an example, but I think that within, the magical community as well, there are some really easy ways like uh, planetary prayers, or as I said, go out and let dawn speak to you about dawn, go out and let the moon of your phase of your time of birth teach you about the moon of your phase of time of birth. Mm -hmm. These can be very gentle and easy ways to start to entangle yourself more in a, in a practice oriented way. And, uh, you know, the other, the last thing I would say about it is one thing I am really excited about uh, is uh, Cadmus is talk about one Orpheus and the idea of art as a model for magic um, because, and this idea of the tension between art and science, but equally he's gonna, he's wanna, I also ended up making him a featured speaker because he was giving a talk as well around how do we start to understand our, um, you know, our unverifiable personal Gnostic experiences when we encounter something and what is a, a, what are some ways forward towards that that make it relevant? Because the, la the last thing I would say that is, that is very relevant within the astral, astrological uh, community, otherwise we only have texts that we can argue and argue and argue about what a text means and what a doctrine means. And then the moment someone says, well, this doctrine worked for me and that doctrine did not work for me, then you know there is something where people have to step away from that and say, mm, okay, but you know the source says this. Do you see what I mean? And right. so we do have to kind of find a way forward that isn't not that we're not interested in text, but not obsessed about text and the way that we are. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, they also contradict at a certain point too. Like a lot of yeah. texts contradict. <laughs> and so Definitely. it comes down to your personal experience of like what actually works for you. And I think we were, we, this is probably going to come out right after our, our talk with J, uh, John Michael Greer on pre psychological modern astrology. And mm -hmm. for him, he uses, um, the modern rulership system, like he uses Uranus yeah. as the ruler of Aquarius, and that he for him he found that it produced better predictions. But he has like okay. Uranus in his first house, whereas like Robert Hand, who you know has been practicing for fifty years or whatever, like he found that the modern rulership system does not work for him. So like, mm. who do you like? You got to go with what works for you, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, some people argue that you make it your own in the end, and that's probably, uh, there is some truth in that. 
But I think that, you know, the other piece is when we go back to learning through experience. Yeah. Or as I said about uh, and recently spent some time at some older sites here in the UK that are orientated and definitely speaking to cyclical and story as it relates to cycle. How do we start to have that be um, a, an important and, and useful source of kind of an empirical approach where we are verifying things mm -hmm. in the landscape? Mm. You know, we're letting the landscape verify rather than the text verify something or my approach. I found that it does. And again, I'm not criticizing yeah. any of that. I think it's all valid. It's just that we have a tendency to default to one or the other. And I, I just always wonder if uh, there isn't more that we can learn to do that is natural for us as human beings, mm. you know, um, that isn't just about obsessing over text or which schema is the one that we can make work. No, that's a bad thing. I work with mostly traditional methods. So I mean, I shouldn't bash it too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and I think it's also important too, because, uh, you know, everyone inhabits a different land and there's a different spirit yes. in, of every land. And also the and land of the sky cheap. also. Yes. There's a land in the sky. Or, yeah. <laughs> Like the yeah. land up here, in, the land and the sky up here in New York are totally different than in Baghdad, uh, you know, in 900 AD. You, you also, you know, like there's there's time too, you know, and like yeah. astrology is is all about time, um, and 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 I think we're living in a it seems clear that we're living in a period where things are changing pretty dramatically, mm. um, too. Like within our in our lifetimes, uh, we'll see yeah. zones shift, we'll see um, moisture patterns shift. Oh, we've got the kitten. One of the kittens. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, so that that is worth everything right there, <laughs> Mr. Floops. I, um, I love all the Floops. I... Oh, His name is Mr. Floops. Reginald Floops. Yeah. Oh, the original <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. But but yeah, uh, I I kind of lost where I was going there. But yeah, no, I think it is a lot of change. And I think, as you said, people are trying to find how to orientate and how to wayfind within that, you know, and I think, I think there's so many different ways to go about it. But that is, uh, you know, definitely something that I was drawn to try to elevate the level of interactions and the discourse around it within astrology in the Western world. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I agree with you. I think it is time that we are able to be a bit fuller in the way in which we know the world and, and can come to be in the world in a new or in a different way. Because something we've known for a while, something's not been working and it's not working. So I just try to focus on things that are more constructive now than taking things apart, you know, uh, mm. we got to move. And I think you guys are at least in my little experience of interacting with you, you know, um, <laughs> you're definitely being uh, engaged and trying to make something. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. And the world needs that. Yeah. And I think maybe there are, there are in the ecosystem uh, of, of society, there's a, there's a role, there's a place for people who like to tear down things and decompose things. Um, but I, but I personally, for me, it makes sense that, uh, I'd rather build what I want to see than destroy what I don't want to see, you know, and, and in a way it, you're by, by putting your energy and attention and resources towards what you want to happen in the world, then you are, you know, moving away from what you don't <laughs> and there's you know there's there's a balance there's but yeah it yeah felt more reactionary um in ways of, yeah you know trying to destroy something it felt like battling uphill and reactionary but building something feels a little bit more um yeah fluid and i don't know feels aligned. better <laughs> yeah it feels a little bit more productive I agree. And I'm sure in your experience, if you have practice uh, ways of working with the place that you live, mm -hmm. it's something that you come to know, you mm -hmm. know, over time. So it's not a, 
it's not a out of the box this is the way and yeah how you do it's like an engagement an entanglement with it you know so yeah well done <laughs> <laughs> well you too so yes as we're we should probably wrap up our our hours together um so where can people find about astro more info about astromagia and yeah so astromagia.org is the best place to go. You can look for Astromagia Org on most social platforms as well, if that's something you are looking for. Um, but yes, the website's probably the easiest way to get a hold of anything. And then with my like my personal work, cunningasfolk.com or again cunning as folk on any of the, the platforms that you might be interested in. If I'm happen to be there, you can find out more about my work there too. And when is the conference? Yeah, the conference is the 8th through the 10th of October, and it's running because you have to anchor it in a time zone, and mm -hmm. it is very disruptive to my own life in terms of waking up and sleeping suddenly on Eastern time again, but uh -huh. it is set to the Eastern time zone okay. just because. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you, you guys are the lucky ones. Yeah. Um, but yes, and it's so uh, it's basically two, two and a half days of, or, you know, three days of, of focus on it. And then anybody that, uh, you know, is there or can't make it to stuff, there's three months so people have until mid January to watch any of the replays awesome. and then we do try to make it easy for people that have attended to get further access to it if they need to keep it going but it is very much you know everyone that participates is uh compensated for their contribution as highly as I possibly can help them to do that and nice. you know it's meant to be very much a like thought of as a group effort and it's for everybody uh that is cool. giving to it you know awesome well yeah. thank you so much for joining us today this was a great chat and it was really nice to get to know you JD yeah lovely to get to know both of you um and I will like in terms of my own work I put out my uh teaching schedule of what I do uh, normally in, in September. So if people are interested, I have some classes that are astrology based, but then also some astro astrological magic classes and some stuff that looking more with another, another scholar practitioner about thinking with uh, decolonization and animism. Um, so a bit more of like a reading self-reflexive like work uh, that's there. So if people are interested, it, you can find out about it at Cunning Spoke. Okay. Yeah, sounds awesome. Awesome. Okay. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you.